Life with Liliana and Friends. Good evening and welcome to Life with Liliana and Friends. We're on episode five this week and we're still in the, the topic greener pastures where we're listening to different stories of people who have moved um, overseas to live and work. And this week we're into part two of a conversation I'm having with my sister-in-law, Maggie Pareti. So Maggie, welcome back. Thank you, thank you for having me back. So we've talked about, we had fun last week, didn't we, with our conversation about coming here, not knowing anything, making your way around Fiji, getting into the culture a bit, then falling in love with this dashing young soldier from the British Army. He whisks you away to the UK and then he leaves you there. Um, because he needs to go on tour and oh, he had to go for a workshop and then he's gone on tour and all of that. So we're going to pick up from there and just talk about now you're living in the UK. Okay. I think you're kind of like accepting the fact that, okay, city's going to be traveling and this is the way it's going to be. And you mentioned last week that you spent a lot of time just like, okay, I'll be on my phone. You maybe watched movies because you didn't have friends. So tell us then, how did you kind of come out of that? What did that look like those days after? Yeah, thanks. So um, I really drive myself with a goal. I kind of move myself along by setting myself a goal. So um, I knew I couldn't just kind of stay in the house forever. <laughs> so um, I started trying to think about where I'd like to work. And um, I was really fortunate to live really close to the University of Cambridge. And I'd worked in higher education in Fiji. And I mean, this was like the biggest opportunity I thought I'd ever get. So I just um, applied for everything, <laughs> everything. Um, and finally managed to get my foot in the door, um, temping at um, uh, the University of Cambridge Development Office. Um, and then eventually moved through the ranks um, in this office. Um, and now I am the recruitment manager um, for the entire office. Um, so I just kind of, I knew I needed to get out of that space. I knew I needed something more to rely on than just city coming home on the weekends. Um, so I kind of just started making a plan of what I wanted to do and just kind of motivated myself that way. That's good. And so you started work and then along come the children. How did that go with city being away and then doing that and then moving and no help like in Fiji? My mom touched on that as well. Yeah, yeah. It was so hard, Lana. Like it was so, so hard. I mean, you got to think about my circumstances as well. I'm the youngest of four children. And no one ever let me touch babies. They just thought she can't handle it. She doesn't know. She's the youngest. Don't let her out though. And I was cool with that. I was like, whatever. I don't want to change a nappy. Um, and then all of a sudden I had my own child and I, and my sister wasn't there and my mom wasn't there. And I had no, like you said, and City, while he was there, he kind of, you know, he was really busy at the time. He was acting up. Um, and he needed to be in the office a lot. And so I just was at a loss. Um, and um, it was really, really difficult. I mean, I pulled myself through. Um, I, I got found some friends and um, found the support system that way. But, you know, had them in nursery and, you know, found all the different ways you can help yourself here. Um, but it was really, really hard. It was really, really difficult. I definitely struggled. Yes. So how do you how do you work through? Because now you have Jackson. So now you have two boys. So now you're like a pro, super mom, doing everything. Um, how do you? Maybe I just want to ask if you can just share that very quickly to see whether it'll help someone else. You know, because I know they're in nursery. How do you organize yourself well enough to get things done? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have learned to ask for help. Good. Is, the, is the God answer. I think when I first had Kian, I was so bent on being the best mom ever and not needing anyone and needing support and look at me go and I can bake cookies and I can sew him a costume and I can do all this stuff. 
And I, what I didn't realize, and I can work a full-time job (laughs) while I'm doing this. And what I didn't realize was I was crumbling inside, but I just, because I'm like, as long as everyone looks at my baby and he is perfect, then nothing else matters. Good. What I didn't realize was I was chipping away at myself. And when I had Jackson, I just was like, no more. I can't do this anymore. I, I, I can't do this on my, by myself. And so I had a really this conversation with City and was just like, I don't know how we're going to do this. I don't know how we're going to finance this, but I cannot do this by myself. I need yes. help. Um, and whether that's you moving back home, whether that's us paying for a nanny, whether it's bringing someone from Fiji, I just need the help. And that's when we brought well, yeah. you to come over and help us out. And yes. A godsend. A godsend. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well done, Maggie. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you asked for help because a lot of us don't. Um, we talked about that in um, another episode. It's just that, and also in our culture as, as women, Fijian uh, women, we just, well, the word we were talking about was wasota. I spoke about that with mom. Like, just do it, just do it. Like, you know, stop complaining, put your head down and do it. Um, But that does eat away at you. Yeah, and I didn't want to look weak. And I didn't want, like, I'm strong. I have a full-time job. I'm, like, taking care of the house. I am doing all this stuff. I can do this. You know, there'd be oftentimes, if you would ask me, like, can I help you with that? Should I do that? And I'd be like, no, I've got it. Because, oh, not because I was like trying to say anything to him. It was just like, I can do this. Like, <laughs> and eventually I was like, what are you doing? Like, you are just yes. falling. Stop it. Like, get the help. Like, ask for the help. Yes. Yeah, it, wonderful. Yeah, the change it has made is just immense. Like, I'm happy. And therefore, everyone else is happier. You know, it's 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 a knock-on effect. So I'm so yeah. glad. And don't forget, you can, you know, the offer is still there for you to send me one of my nephews. I'm so ready. Or I will come and get them in an instant. I remember saying, well, I can just take him. I can just take him. And you're like, mm, just avoiding, my, <laughs> avoiding eye contact, Lilian. <laughs> Well, you know, we're going to go into a quick break, Maggie, um, and then we'll come back and we'll talk a bit more about coming back home, because I know that would be one of the best things about being back home is just that support, right? Um, But to our viewers, we'll be back very shortly. Call your friends, get a drink, and we'll see you in a minute. Life with Liliana and Friends. Life with Liliana and Friends. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, make sure you go back and you see the recording online because Maggie just shared a great gem about asking for help. But now we're going to move into coming back to Fiji. So Maggie, there are plans for you to come back to Fiji that makes your mother-in-law and your sister-in-law very, very happy. Tell us why come back to Fiji. And also while you're talking about that, maybe share with us some concerns you might have with relocating back? I mean, Fiji was always the end game. Always. When we came, when I came to England to stay with City, it was never sort of like, okay, let's, let's get our roots down. Let's build a family. Let's buy a home. Um, it was always, when are we going to go back? When, is it now? No? Okay give it two years is it now we've always had this conversation it's been a never-ending conversation and it changes over the years um uh but I just feel like that's probably where we belong and so it's gonna happen definitely um, the reasons that I want to come back is sort of similar to city I just see my sons growing up there. I just see myself getting old there. I just love life in Fiji. It's so different. It's not here. You feel like you're running a rat race. You're working a job so you can make money, so you can pay bills. And then it just cycles again. 
But in Fiji, mm. it's different. And it doesn't feel like a rat race, even though you're going to work and you're making money. And it just, there's so many other things that are going on that make it feel. And, and maybe it's because you're all there. Like mm. all, all, you know, there's that support unit that we were talking about. There's, you know, I can't wait. Honestly, I cannot wait until the day that you just walk into my house on a Saturday and you're like, Kian, Jackson, let's go. And you know, and I just, that's how it should be. That's how it should be. And um, I feel, and I think Siti feels this too. You feel this sense of guilt that you're not giving your kids that well-rounded life. I mean, even mm. me growing up in Canada, I, I had aunties, I had uncles, I had to go to baby showers, I had to go to Christmas parties, I had to, you know, there was all this other stuff mm. that we just in the UK because we don't have you guys. A lot mm. of people, why don't I want to move back to Canada? Because that's where I'm from. And why wouldn't I move back there? But I don't know. It's just, I don't feel like that's where I'm going to end up. I just don't feel that wow. all to Canada the way I feel it to Fiji. I love my family in Canada. Like I cried when I couldn't see them for two years because of COVID. Um, I love Canada, but there's just something, I don't know. My dad always said like, there's this, sometimes there's this draw in Fijian people that they just get pulled back to Fiji. Wow. And that's literally how I feel. That's how I feel. So what things concern you though? Because you said it's kind of fluid. You're like, okay, let's move now. Let, let's not move yet. What is it? It's getting in the way. There are a few things for me that I'm constantly checking up on. Um, the economy. Like, I need to be sure that when I come back, there's going to be a job for me. And I'm going to be able to make mm -hmm. money in the city. And, um, you know, COVID has hit you guys really hard. And it's, it's mm -hmm. scary. Um, mm -hmm. Everywhere is scary right now. But I mean, I'm thinking about the economy and what it's done to people and how people have lost their jobs and people have lost their businesses. And, it, and that's just worrying to someone like me who potentially could want to come back to Fiji and build a business. So that's mm -hmm. really, and I got to think about my kids and how I'm going to provide for them. Um, another thing is, um, you know, the politics, you know, the government, you know, I'm constantly watching that space. You know, that's something that we have to consider crime. Crime rate in Fiji has changed a lot since I left in 2013. Drugs. I mean, this is the stuff like I think about as a mother. I'm not, I don't know that city would think about this kind of stuff, but like I worry about my sons. All I think about is my sons and what I'm going to give them and what opportunities I'm going to provide for them. And so all these things really, really matter to me. Yeah, that's good. And what about education? Because kids just started school. I mean, it is a concern. I mean, it is, it's not a massive concern for me. Yes. Um, there are great schools in Fiji. There are great yes. opportunities in Fiji for schooling. I mean, yes. I work in the weekend, so I know what's available. It might be expensive, yes. but there are, are, there are like opportunities. Options. Yeah. It doesn't really bother me that much. That's good because you raised some great points. You know, there is the, while we have a beautiful culture, there are some of these things, especially drugs you touched on. Um, and the situation gets a little scary um, when you see what's going on. And you're right, you've got two young boys. And so I love that you shared your heart, uh, mother's heart, really, um, talking about that. But it's interesting thinking about what you're saying and then what mom said, because she also talked about that, you know, I felt like I had to bring, I owed it to you guys to bring you back home. And it's, it's amazing to see, even though you're from different generations, there's that similarity. So when you talk to mom, do you find uh, similarities in your stories, even though she was there like in the 70s? Honestly, yes. Like sometimes your mom can say something to me and it makes me want to cry because I know yeah. she's what I'm on about. Like, yes. like one time I came home for Christmas and me and your mom were standing around and she patted me on the shoulder and she said, how are you doing? That's all she said. But the fact that it was coming from her, I knew she knew exactly what right. I was going to do. 
And I just wanted to crumble. I was like almost started sobbing yeah. because you. And she was like, she was basically saying, kind of like, I feel you, and it's so, and you're doing well, you know. And yes. it didn't change like seven, you know, however many years ago to now, we all yes. went same thing. That's right. I love that. And because you're right, like as you. Um, wives of British Army soldiers, it's difficult for us to really understand. And it's not really something you can articulate in into words. Yeah. And I don't think you can really realize it until you're amongst other military wives. Right. Since right. I was like, oh, I don't need military wives. I'm I'm a career woman. I'm over here doing my career. Like I, I don't really need that. And then when I had Kian, yes. I I started attending a military wives training boot camp. And, the, and like, just wow. the conversations you have, you're like, oh my God, these women know exactly what I'm talking about. How I'm yes. feeling. You need that. Like, you you don't think you need it. Like, you think you can be outside of that, but actually yes. you need that support. Yes. That's so good. We're going to go into a quick break. And I love that you ended with that because this is, you know, the foundation that Life with Liliana is on, just having these conversations, they're so important to empower, to encourage others, right? To just help each other along in this journey that we're all on. I'll see you soon. Life with Liliana and Friends. Life with Liliana and Friends. Welcome back. We're in the last part of episode five with Maggie, my sister-in-law based in the UK. So Maggie, now I was hoping you could just leave some, I guess some of the lessons that you've learned that you could leave with some other military wives, Fijian military wives that are in the UK now. Let's give it up to the military wives. Like <laughs> they yes. are some of the strongest women I have ever met. Um, you know, sometimes I just think some Fijian British military wives get stigmatized as they come over and they're kind of maybe housewives or look after the kids. And these women are the backbone of their families. They take care of everything. They might have kids. They take them to school. They run them to nursery. They do everything, all the doctor's appointments, all the haircuts, all the, you know, make the food, pay the bills, like absolutely everything. Um, and I just like bow down to them and like they deserve all the awards and all the accolades and all the claps in the world, honestly. Um, I don't think there's anything I could say to kind of add to what, what these women are able to do. I mean, they're just fundamental backbones of every family unit that I've ever yes. like, seen. And I'm, I'm, I'm like in awe of what they're capable of doing coming just straight yeah. out of city and just being plopped in the middle of the UK and they just yeah. sort of out. and like you said they don't ask for any help they don't look for anyone to come and save them you know they go and get jobs they're they're nurses they're you know they're you know I, everything I just I I don't I have no nothing to say to those women because yes. they anything in their own right completely yes well, that's so good. But I think there's one thing that you just touched on earlier about asking for help. I think maybe that's something it's almost like give your, yourself permission to ask for help when you when you need it. It's OK. It's OK. Yeah. And I mean, there are great networks um, within the UK. And I mean, and that could be the Fijian community. I mean, like, there's so many Fijian communities and every barracks everywhere there's a small Fijian contingency and when they find that you're coming to the barracks they will find you they will bring you into their group yes but not only that yes. like go to the drop-in mom mom play dates and meet a whole bunch of other kinds of moms go to join right. a gym meet some other people from the local area um like yes. I did military boot camp uh, and and meet wives that way. Um, just kind of like, exp I think the biggest thing I could tell people is just create that support network around you. Um, That's great. Often we think we're good, we can handle it, but actually 
just lean on somebody. I mean, it's COVID. Times are tough, man. Like, get some help. Yeah, yeah that's great. That's great, Maggie. So what about uh, thinking back to when you first went across, right? So there'll be other young women who are looking to move across. What can you advise them? I think if you, um, again, create a network within the UK, don't kind of think that you can call your mom every day and you'll be fine. So if you create that network, create that support system here. Um, and uh, for me, it was just have a goal, have a target, um, you know, have something you want to get out of this. I mean, you have to think the UK is an amazing opportunity. When you get here, the, you know, there's so many opportunities available to people. Um, why not take advantage of it, you know, mm. kind of go out and do those things that you wanted to do. I mean, you don't, yeah. you know, come here kind of without the the strain of your extended family and all everything you're, you know, generally you come in, you're by yourself with your kids or with your family. And so you have that opportunity to kind of do you, like kind of push yeah. yourself to be better and do the things that you want to do as well. It's your time as well. Yes. That's so good. I love that. I love that you said that because I don't think we think about that as often as we should. It's almost like I'm going there. I need to be the support for my husband. And you do. So just before we end, what about that, you know, the conversations that um, you've had with City? How has that evolved? Because I suppose, again, you went in the honeymoon, uh, you're in your honeymoon phase. Now you've got two kids, but and you're not often together. I can imagine how important that communication is. Um, can you just share that before we finish off? It's essential. It's the foundation that everything is laid on. If we can't communicate with each other, everything just kind of crumbles away. So, I mean, um, and it's as simple as you're going to be where you're going to be when you say you're going to be there. It's, it's as simple as things right. like because he he moves so often like he could go to Oxford then he could go to Wales then he could go and then during that week he could go to somewhere else and um just being in communication with me constantly is really really important and not only does it help our relationship it also helps our relationship with our children so just making sure that I'm communicating you know Kian has a play on Friday you should really be there it, he would really appreciate that. Yeah, okay, I'm going to change my schedule so that I can be there and Keen can see that I'm present. Because you got to think, like, yes. seeing their daddy all week either. You know, Kian's now five yes. years old. That's going to start playing out differently as he gets older. So he's yes. got to, he's in, he FaceTimes them every night. He talks to both boys every single evening. I talk to him probably three times a day. So, I mean, you just got to make sure that you, me and City are always on the same level. We know kind of what direction we're going and we're going there together. I think sometimes yeah. well, you can start going like this very easily, very, very easily, right. especially when you're living apart. So it's yes. really important just to make sure that you're in line with each other and you're moving in the same direction. That's fantastic advice. And, you know, I'm, I also feel like you're speaking to the cities out there. So the men, the British Army soldiers, sorry, the husbands, you know, it has to be intentionality from both sides, not just the wife, but both sides. And, and in our culture, when you come, we'll come from a culture that's quite different because the man just pretty much does his own thing most of the time. But there, in order to thrive, you need to be on the same page, don't you? And it's those small things. I love that you're just talking about small things, Maggie. Um, and in City's conversation, we touched on that. Small things are important to do right because that helps the bigger things, doesn't it? Well, we have come to the end of two episodes already. And I always love talking to you, Maggie. Thank you for making time to come onto the show. I know it's late where you are. Thanks so much, Maggie. And to our viewers, thank you for joining us tonight. I really hope that you are able to extract some useful um, gems. I will see you back for episode six next week on my TV at 8 p.m. 
Binaka. Life with Liliana and Friends 